So uh, it's uh, wonderful to welcome you here this evening. Uh, this evening we have a, a treat. Uh, if you have attended events like this in the past, you know we've talked with politicians, uh, cabinet secretaries. Tonight we have somebody that I really want to have a conversation with. Uh, and that is uh, Robert Harris, uh, who is the author of 12 novels, almost all of which I have devoured. Robert Harris is one of my favorite novelists. Uh, and he also, uh, like me, is somebody who has been a columnist, a journalist. Uh, he was a, a journalist first as a student at Cambridge, uh, then worked for The Observer. At the age of 30, he was political editor of The Observer. Uh, he then, in ways we'll discuss, uh, found his way to being a, a novelist and has really never look back, um, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I want to begin uh, tonight by inviting people in the audience or people watching us uh, live on the stream to send questions to me, which I will uh, relay to Robert, uh, if I think they're suitable to ask him. <laughs> uh, and you should send them to a hashtag post live, uh, and they'll uh, show up on my little iPad here. Um, this is uh, Robert's new novel, uh, Munich. Uh, if you read the, our local newspaper this morning, uh, you'll see that our critic, uh, Patrick Anderson, who often reviews uh, thrillers, reviewed it and uh, said of, of the book, uh, which obviously being about Munich features Neville Chamberlain as a central figure. His new novel offers a painful look at an honorable man longing for peace, but confronting an adversary who had only conquest in mind and only contempt for Chamberlain's good intentions. And then uh, the, the reviewer concludes, once again, Harris has brought history to life with exceptional skill. So I invite you to read the book, but I want to begin by asking uh, Robert about uh, Munich, a, a word, an event that's uh, as, as laden with meaning, heavy with meaning, uh, as any in, in modern history. You write in the acknowledgments at the end of this book that you have uh, had a mild obsession <laughs> with what happened at Munich for, for 30 years. And I want to ask you to begin by talking about how that obsession began, what, what it is that fascinated you 30 years ago about this story, and what you then came back to in the novel. Well, I uh, was, um, I made a documentary for the 50th anniversary of the Munich Agreement. This year will mark the 80th anniversary. So um, I know I don't look old enough to have done something 30 years ago, but I did. <laughs> and. Uh, I interviewed people who'd been there. I interviewed Neville Chamberlain's parliamentary private secretary, Alec Douglas Hume, later prime minister, who, who actually was the only person, apart from the translator, alone with Hitler in Hitler's apartment when the famous piece of paper was signed. Um, and I interviewed Chamberlain's daughter, people now long since dead. And I realized that um, almost everything one thinks, the popular conception of Munich, is wrong. Um, and it's almost the complete opposite. Hitler regarded the Munich Agreement as a, as a setback. And indeed, at the end of his life, he, brain, he blamed it for, for losing the war. Uh, Chamberlain uh, got the better of him, is the truth. But that's not something that most of us know. And every time any conflict came up, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, Assad, uh, outcomes, Munich, appeasement, and, and it's just not right. And it's, it's one of those things that's got into the bloodstream and it, it has an effect. I think it's one of the few things that still casts a shadow over the modern world. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to write about it. That and the moral compromises involved at the time, shameful as many people thought. If we were to have a, a proper understanding of what Munich means, what that analogy ought to represent, what would it be? It would be 
that Hitler really wanted to have a war in September 1938. He obviously wanted the Sudeten Germans back or into the German Reich, but really what he wanted to do was drive straight through Czechoslovakia, take Prague, which he thought he would do in a week. He developed the Blitzkrieg tactics and it was the first time he planned to use them. And uh, he was thwarted in this because Chamberlain was de as determined to avoid war as he was to have a war. And uh, he flew to meet Hitler, a thing which was a huge gamble. One of the things I try to convey in the novel is that Chamberlain was not this weak, senile, old fool. He was a dynamic, ruthless, you one may say misguided, but nevertheless incredibly uh, strong-willed man. And uh, basically, uh, Hitler, surprised to find himself confronted by the British Prime Minister, told him, outlined grievances. And Chamberlain said, well, to paraphrase, let me see what I can do. And suddenly, Hitler found himself enmeshed in democracy, which he didn't really want to be trapped in at all, and was very careful to avoid in September 1939. He would never specify any demands that could be met vis-a-vis -vis Poland. And uh, so Chamberlain got what he wanted, which was to postpone or avoid war, uh, because the British certainly weren't ready, either materially or morally. And Hitler felt thwarted. One of the reasons I wrote the novel uh, was because I came across a diary uh, published, kept by Joachim Fess, the German journalist, who was the ghostwriter for Albert Speer's memoirs, Inside the Third Reich. And he, in, in May 1969, Speer asked, was asked by Fest about Munich. And Speer said, Hitler was in a foul mood for weeks after Munich. And he took it out on his staff, which was unusual for him. And eventually at a private function, it all came pouring out. He said, the German people have been duped and by Chamberlain of all people. And at the end of his life, in February 1945, he was still going on about Munich. He said that we should have gone to war in 1938. September 1938 would have been the perfect time. And most people simply aren't aware of this view of Hitler's of the Munich Agreement. They think, oh, he managed to bluff and get stuff out of the British and French, the cowardly British and French, and um, thus emboldened, he went on to war. It's, it's simply not like that. Munich is, is a synonym in our modern political uh, lexicon for appeasement uh, and weakness. One of the enduring images of the book for me uh, is your description of the, of the crowds cheering for Chamberlain, both in Germany, you, you say that these crowds that would gather outside of his hotel, wherever he appeared, really were the, in effect, German anti-war uh, protesters, and the crowds that cheered when he got back home to, uh, to England. So the question that obviously we wonder about is, is how did your uh, characterization of these events um, get replaced by uh, the, the version in which Munich means uh, weakness, means capitulation? And that takes me just to get to the point I wanna, I wanna hear your thoughts about. Uh, the symbolic figure, counterpoint to, to the weak Chamberlain in our historic, historical reading, is the strong Winston Churchill, the hero of this story. Chamberlain is the villain, as it's pro commonly told, and Ch uh, Churchill is the hero. And I wonder, you're challenging uh, the Chamberlain side, what, what about the Churchill side, and to what extent did Churchill manipulate the image of, of Chamberlain to his own political advantage? Well, Chamberlain's great misfortune was uh, to die very soon after he ceased to be prime minister. Uh, and he, he, he became a very useful scapegoat for everybody, for the ruling Conservative Party that wished to distance themselves from him. And um, even more effectively, perhaps the Labour Party. The Labour Party had voted against every measure of rearmament that Neville Chamberlain introduced, including in March 1939, conscription. They denounced Chamberlain as a warmonger. Uh, but in the summer of 1940, it became very con convenient to blame him for everything that had gone wrong. Chamberlain in 1939 was spending 50% of British government spending was on armaments. 
the Spitfires were commissioned under Chamberlain, the radar and so on. And when Chamberlain was dying in the summer of 1940, he said, well, if I'm to be blamed for the deficiencies, surely I should get some credit for, well, the Spitfires that were winning the Battle of Britain. Churchill respected Chamberlain and Chamberlain was loyal to him. And Churchill did a wonderful eulogy of Chamberlain when he died in November 1940. But he did say privately, Paul Neville will come badly out of history, I know, because I will write the history. Uh, mm. And I think that that's what's happened. And, and Chamberlain sort of slipped into this place of being completely friendless, really. The Tories didn't want to know him. Labour despised him. And, and Churchill is such a powerful and romantic and human figure, almost he's become a kind of secular saint, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Um, that, of course, the sheer force of his personality obliterates the rather aloof, shy, um, slightly stuffy Chamberlain. Um, and none of this matters except insofar um, as there is, a, there is a political dimension to this that is still effective today. Um, I read the tweet by Governor Huckabee, who saw the film about Winston Churchill just on the day after Christmas, that comparing Obama to Chamberlain and saying that he did nothing but retreat. Well, that's not true. Chamberlain was one of only two men who ever declared war on Adolf Hitler rather than the other way around. And, and Churchill, who faced a, a completely black and white issue of confronting evil, um, I think it's misleading to think that most issues are quite as simple as that. One of the reasons it was simple, incidentally, is because Neville Chamberlain had, as it were, demonstrated that Hitler wasn't to be trusted. He bequeathed to Churchill not only the spitfires, but also the moral strength that came from having done everything possible to avoid the war. We just have experienced another big, uh, in fact, two, really, uh, in the last year, uh, Churchill movies, movies about that that moment, that galvanizing moment. Um, so I'm very curious about whether um, there's a movie interest in 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 this book. So many of your books have been made into into films. Are people interested in this one? It strikes me to be an extraordinarily interesting story as you as you describe it. Well, it has been sold to be a uh, to be a, a TV series actually, and a joint venture by British and American uh, and German. Uh, producers, um, are ma mostly made in Germany with German actors, but with the British actors playing the British characters, and that will be fascinating uh, to see it. I don't suppose it will, obviously, it would be hard to confront the Gary Oldman kind of juggernaut of Churchilliana. <laughs> I mean, there's not going to be a Neville Chamberlain uh, s s set of centers in the United States promulgating the word of Chamberlain. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope there is some slight corrective, not least, for instance, most people, I keep reading this in the coverage of uh, Darkest Hour, they think, they say that Chamberlain wanted a, a negotiated peace with Hitler. The opposite is the case. Ch Chamberlain loyally backed Churchill in May 1940 uh, and repudiated the idea of hearing a peace offer from uh, Hitler, unlike Halifax. Um, you know, things like that, I think, have, have been just been steamrolled off the record. So I want to ask you, uh, your specialty uh, over the years has become historical uh, fiction. Uh, and I want to ask you about uh, how you make decisions about fact and fiction. Uh, it's a question people often ask me about, about my novels, which are drawn closely from the world of fact, from real intelligence uh, operations, but our, but our novels. In this book, the two central figures, uh, British aide to Chamberlain, Hugh uh, Leggett, uh, and a German uh, in the foreign ministry, Paul von Hartmann, are both uh, uh, fictional characters, but they're absolutely central to the story. So I found myself wondering how much you allowed yourself to invent uh, because uh, there is, you know, when you have real characters called Adolf Hitler, Neville Chamberlain, you, the reader begins to believe that this is a, a true story. 
Yes, I mean, I think there is a sort of moral responsibility to try to be accurate. Um, uh, my rule is always to not put anything in that I know for a fact didn't happen. Um, once I've made that rule to myself, then I, that I then allow myself to invent. Um, we know the civil servant, the private secretary who flew with Chamberlain on his plane to see Hitler was a man called Cecil Sires, whose son actually has been in touch with me. Uh, in, I bumped Sires off the plane and put my man on instead. And Mr. Sires Jr. very kindly <laughs> said he's sure his father would have approved. Uh, and uh, so he is, so I, I slot him in and it, it means that I hope the reader can feel what it was like, the tension in Downing Street, the, the meeting with the chiefs of staff that Chamberlain had when Hitler had announced that he would mobilize the next day. Uh, the chiefs of staff told uh, Chamberlain that we only had 20 proper modern aircraft to protect the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, the Hurricanes, all their guns froze at 15,000 feet. Most of the RAF fighter squadrons were biplanes. Uh, so my man is there when Chamberlain has that meeting. Then he goes on the plane to, to see Hitler. And, uh, and conversely, uh, the young German, they were both students together at Oxford. They haven't seen one another for eight years or six years. Uh, he is in the foreign ministry and he travels on Hitler's train from Berlin to Munich and and what I wanted to do was to really take the reader into the world in onto Chamberlain's plane into Hitler's train and the two of them their own conflicts of loyalty um, and their own disrupted friendship and that feeling that these two men in 1938 young men who are being drawn ineluctably towards war and disaster, that feeling of being powerless. Um, I wanted to convey that as well. Uh, so for me, these are like cameras that, that bring alive the history. But I try to keep the history accurate, not least because the history is so interesting. Um, I mean, you know, in Darkest Hour, which I enjoyed, some of the most interesting things are not in there, actually. Truth is often much more interesting than anything one can invent. Uh. I, I am an absolute believer in that. Um, the, um, uh, without giving away anything in the novel, because I, I want to encourage people to, 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 to read it, um, there's a fascinating what if that's embedded in this, in this book. Um, what if uh, Chamberlain had been convinced that uh, German designs were so dangerous that he hadn't uh, signed the famous piece of paper I have here, that, you know, from Herr Hitler. Um, uh, is, is it your view that there is an alternative version of how this story might have gone, in which Chamberlain walks away from Munich, refusing appeasement, and that has a good outcome? I mean, what's your judgment? Suppose, suppose uh, Chamberlain had just had walked out. What, 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 what would have happened then in that book? Well, um, my view is that world history would have been very different. And I cannot convince myself, I cannot see that it was anything other than however shameful necessary to avoid war in 1938. I've already mentioned Hitler's own view about it. I think it's almost certain that uh, uh, if the talks had broken down, then uh, the German army would have moved into Czechoslovakia. And Hitler thought he would take it over in a week. Forty divisions to smash Czechoslovakia. Ten divisions left at the end of the week to hold it down. Thirty transferred to the Western Front to deal with anything from the British and the French. The French had already made it clear to the British uh, and they were the ones with a proper land army, that they wouldn't move until the summer of 1939 when the British were supposed to arrive. Um, I think, and Chamberlain certainly felt, it would be very difficult to convince the British people less than 20 years after the First World War in which they'd lost the British alone, three quarters of a million dead, that they would continue to fight on the issue of whether three and a half million Sudeten Germans should be in this new state of Czechoslovakia or in Germany, where clearly most of them wanted to be. It was, Chamberlain just thought, 
And I think most people probably thought it was just not an issue on which to fight a world war. Therefore, there is a danger that the whole British and French war effort would have crumbled. Hitler wanted to attack France and invade France in 1939. And throughout his life, he thought he was a year behind the schedule he wanted, you know. He wanted to knock out France in 1939. He wanted to invade Russia in 1940. And he, was, he, was, he missed it by 12 months. And the British rearmed, strong enough that they couldn't be conquered. And the Russians developed tens of thousands of tanks, which made it impossible for him to conquer Russia. That's why he was lamenting till the end of his life that, that he'd failed. Now, you may say this is just a lucky byproduct for Chamberlain, who sincerely believed he was going to get peace from Hitler. I don't think the record shows that either. I think he hoped that Hitler would stick to the deal. But the, have you ever been struck by the strange wording of that piece of paper? We, the reason it reads so strangely is that what Chamberlain actually put, set down in two paragraphs was Hitler's own words delivered in the Sports Palace in Berlin at the beginning of the week, promise, saying that he only wanted uh, that reconciliation between Britain and Germany and that he was resolved the two countries should never go to war again. And Chamberlain went to his apartment to get him to put his name to the thing he'd said in this speech. And the Foreign Office officials travelling with Chamberlain were horrified <laughs> in that way of government officials. And uh, Chamberlain said, um, I think with luck he may stick to it, but if he doesn't stick to it, the whole world will see, and it may bring the Americans in, and I propose to make a big thing of it when I get back to London. And that's what he did. He got off the plane, he waved it in front of the newsreel cameras, he destroyed his reputation as a result, but he did what he wanted to do, which was to pin Hitler very publicly to his words of peace, which of course he then broke. I don't think it's realistic to think that Chamberlain could have come back from Munich and said, listen everybody, I, we've stopped him for, for a few months, but there's going to be war, we're going to spend 50% of our tax revenues on armaments um, because this would have been just like the First World War. This would completely undercut everything he was trying to do. He said that the British, having lost three quarters of a million people only 20 years before, that he said that he thought the country would have a spiritual breakdown if people didn't see their leaders trying to do everything possible to avoid another calamitous war. And I have, so I have sympathy for the, for the situation in which he found himself. One more uh, question about, about the, the story that, that you tell. Uh, you suggest that um, if Chamberlain had walked away and Hitler had invaded, that there was a chance, invaded uh, the Sudetenland, there was a chance that um, the German army would have rebelled, that anti-Hitler sentiment was so uh, pervasive in the foreign ministry and parts of the army that uh, there, was, there was a chance that this nightmare that lay ahead could have been averted because people would have risen up against him. What, what, what's your own judgment about that? I, I, I think it's extremely unlikely that the German army would have turned on Hitler, to be perfectly honest. He was the most successful leader they'd since Bismarck, and um, although a lot of them were starting for the first time to realize where he was possibly going to lead them, I don't think that they would have arrested him or killed him. Um, I think that, uh, and the proof of that, if you want some evidence, is that von Brauchitz, the head of the army at the time, the only man who could have actually issued an order operationally to say, surround the Reich Chancellery and arrest him, he was approached in 1947 in a British prisoner of war camp uh, by, a, by a German intelligence officer called Otto John. And John said to him, what are these stories, which had started to circulate, that you, that you were prepared to arrest Hitler? And Brauch had said to him, you must be, me, arrest Hitler, you must be crazy. Mm. And uh, why would he lie about that? I mean, 1947, he died the following year. It would have been in his interest to say, you know, oh yes, I knew I wanted to stop him, but the cowardly British and French gave way at Munich. Uh, so I think it's a non-starter. And the f 
brutal fact of the matter is that the German army didn't move against Adolf Hitler until this July 1944. It was clear to absolutely everybody that they were going to lose. And I'm afraid that is the truth of the matter. As long as he was winning, they were perfectly happy to have him. It was only when it looked like he was going to lose that they moved against him. With this uh, novel, uh, uh, Robert Harris, come back to the terrain that you began your career as a novelist uh, on. If, if people haven't read it, they should. Fatherland was your, your first novel, and it, it's an alternative history that imagines that Hitler, the Germans, uh, had, had won. And it makes you th think in a, a deep and contrarian way ab about, about these events. Uh, and I, I want to ask you about what happened to Germany in this story of Nazism, which Munich is a one uh, uh, landmark, but, but there, there are many, uh, and how it happened. Uh, and I, I want to pose the question to you this way. Uh, in uh, February of 2016, as our presidential campaign was beginning to go haywire, I was in Munich. And I was walking those beautiful streets and looking at the magnificent Baroque uh, architecture of restored Munich. And I thought to myself, um, this jewel of culture and civilization, is, this is the place where it began. This place tells us that good countries can go bad. And I, that was a powerful feeling in February uh, 2016. It's more powerful today. I don't want to make this a political conversation. But I want to ask you about how that happened in Germany, how this, how this great uh, country of learning and the very essence of civilization went over the lip of a waterfall with the catastrophic consequences, and what uh, that tells us about this larger question, how good, good countries go bad. Well. I think this is quite a troubling time uh, in the world uh, and I think that endlessly one goes back to, the, to Germany uh, because of the civilization of the country, the learning, the culture, the music, the literature and the fact and the sophistication of its <coughs> industry and so on and that it could, this could have happened. and. Uh, of course, it's true that German, Germany was a relatively new country, 1870, and that democracy was, had very shallow roots there. Nevertheless, uh, it is frightening, and I think that one circles these stories and writes about them, whether it's Germany or the collapse of the Roman Republic, the Cicero books that I've written, because really, what we think are very solid institutions, big buildings, you know, history. I'm afraid they're paper thin, is the lesson of history. They can go very quickly. And uh, I, there's a book by Hugh Trevor Roper called The European Witch Craze of the 16th and 17th centuries. And he asks a very fundamental question in that. How could it be that in sophisticated Central Europe, 40,000 people were burnt as witches at the time of the Renaissance, after the Renaissance, when the church outlawed belief in witches in the Dark Ages. He said the whole incident is a warning against those who think that humanity and history is an endless progress of endless enlightenment and improvement. It simply is not. The, the Roman democracy was highly sophisticated, centuries old, and in the space of 30 years or so, it, it, it simply collapsed. And, and the, the story of what happened in Germany fits into that pattern. And, uh, you know, we, we have to constantly be on our guard and looking out and, 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 and being concerned about, about threats to to our, what we take for granted, frankly, because the natural state of humanity is not to have liberal democracies in which everyone can say whatever they like. Thinking of your, of your trilogy about, uh, about Cicero, uh, again, just superb uh, historical novels, um, uh, that story of the, the 
fall of, of the Roman Republic, uh, the way in which Rome became a very different kind of country, uh, is the kind of baseline for th thinking about my question, why good societies, good countries uh, go bad. And I'd love to hear a, a little more from you about how you see that story. As I remember uh, those novels, what we would call today populism, infected Rome. Uh, and, and the politicians who understood how to, how to play to no. it uh, became successful. Cicero, this uh, thoughtful man, uh, decent man, stood outside of that. Well, th thinking now about, about the story you told in those three novels, um, what would be your, your account of, of what happened to Rome that, uh, that cracked that, the, the, its democratic uh, traditions and led to authoritarian government? I think that uh, the, it was a citizen's militia, essentially the Roman democracy. It was even organized along centuries of voters and so on. It was just that the army was electing its commanders. And it was very successful when Rome was relatively small. But as Rome grew bigger and bigger and became the world's main sole superpower, it was, no, it was no longer sufficient. I mean, there were standing armies in places like Syria and in Gaul, um, and the revenues from these places were colossal, and the money sloshing through Rome meant that the, the democratic structure became, it lost all credibility. It was, just, it was just susceptible to bribery. I mean, Cato spent years trying to get campaign finance reform through uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 so, and everything became then mired in, in, in lawsuits. There was, if you like, gridlock. And into this stepped unscrupulous, often hugely wealthy men who sided with the mob the, or the poor. They said Caesar, but Caesar not alone, of course, Catiline and others, and they uh, turned on the elite. Uh, they, they said that the problem was all the doing of the elite, and the society became polarized, and there became a complete, almost 50-50 division as to what the Republic existed for. And at that moment, the whole thing split apart and collapsed. Uh, th that, that is what happened then. Didn't mean the end of Rome, of course. Rome then rose, became even more powerful as an empire. Uh, but democracy had gone, and democracy disappeared from the world for more than a thousand years. Uh, when I say democracy, of course, there was plenty wrong with the Roman system. You know, women couldn't vote, slaves couldn't vote. It was weighted in the interests of the rich. Nevertheless, there were a million voters eligible in the time when, Rome, when Cicero was uh, running for consul. So, you know, it's, that's what haunted me and drew me to that subject. Um, perhaps sometimes I thought, why have I devoted 10 years of my life to writing about Cicero, for God's sake? And then actually it's only in the last year or two that I've started to see why I probably did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> those, those novels are, are really repay uh, reading now. I'm, I'm curious, Cicero is such a wonderful character in those three books. He's just absolutely lovable. Sometimes... Uh, makes dreadful mistakes. Um, he has an unpleasant uh, side that should, that should capture. But I'm just curious whether there's anybody in the contemporary political landscape who reminds you at all of Cicero. <laughs> well, uh, I suppose there are, I mean, oratory, uh, thoughtfulness, uh, uh, a kind of uh, moderate pragmatism, uh, uh, humanity, a dislike of violence and crudeness. Uh, any politician that fits that bill, I would think is like Cicero. Um, he took the view that, the, that a politician, a statesman, as he would have called it, should be like a doctor. Uh, that they would try, and the body politic was the patient, and they would try all manner of cures to try and help the health of the patient. And he said that never for a second has Caesar taken that view of politics. I mean, Caesar was in it totally for himself, for his own glory, 
uh, and and people were merely kind of you know extras in the great story. I mean, that is, I mean, I know other people take a different view about Caesar, but Caesar strikes me as a psychopath, actually, uh, in terms of the genocide he inflicted on countries. You know, Gaul, boasting about killing hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. Cicero would never have done that. He was squeamish even about the games. Um, so that, uh, that is the sort of politician I'm, I'm instinctively like, you know, the one that tries to keep the show on the road, as it were, who's wary of extreme nostrums from either side. That's unfashionable, I'm afraid, at the moment, both in your country and in mine. You uh, worked uh, for a time uh, for uh, Tony Blair. No, I never uh, worked for him. Did you not work for him? No, I annoyed him, uh, <laughs> followed him round, but I never worked for him. No. But, but you were, let me, I hope get this closer to right, that you were early in his prime ministership fairly enthusiastic about him as a, as a leader. Well. Uh, then kind of lost that, that, that hope. But I'd just be interested in your talking about, about Tony Blair, who um, is such an interesting, uh, complicated person uh, who, it seems, from this distance, came to such an unhappy end. Well, I knew him before he became leader of the Labour Party, and he was such a breath, breath of fresh air. He was like talking to any one of one's you know, contemporaries. He was like a guy who lived next door. He was immensely sort of ordinary, if I can put it that way. I mean, highly intelligent and attractive, charming, but essentially he was the sort of man you might go on holiday with, with the kids or something. And uh, uh, that was really what he started off bringing into British politics, a sense of com just common sense. You know, let's just try and make this work. Whatever's the best idea, let's use it. Yes, we stand for certain progressive ideas, but let's put them in a modern context. You know, this was, in its way, revolutionary. And he had a huge wind behind him and a colossal majority. Um, and for a while, all, thing, all went well. I did know him quite well. I admired him very much. I always sensed there was something not going to work here because it was too much all things to all men. And at some point, you're going to have to make stands in politics, as you know, and then things start to change. But he had a tremendous run of success. Um, but one of the things that draws me to write about politics is the way that politics, the power, it's like this kind of nuclear energy or something that unless it's carefully screened behind protective shields and handled only for a short time, it's immensely destructive to everyone who tries to hold on to it. And I think after a few years, he began to think he could walk on water. That's what I'm afraid happens in politics. One of the great things in America is that you restrict your leaders to eight years maximum. In Britain, they, when it, once you pass eight years and get to 10 years, then things all start to go wrong because the leader loses touch with reality, is the truth. And uh, he then uh, parted company with his own supporters um, and he, he became far too close to George Bush, uh, which would have been dangerous for a conservative leader, but was poisonous for the leader of a, of a left-wing party. And uh, it ended in the way that it did. And, and it's been a tragedy for British politics because B Tony Blair is still a relatively young man. He's only 64. He should have had one of those careers which went on a long time, like a Churchill, who, who, who was still sitting in Parliament in 1964. Uh, but instead he removed himself, he left Parliament, and he did damage to his reputation from which he, it seems impossible for him to recover. And a, with him went not only his eloquence, but a whole, he's infected and made toxic a whole kind of progressive politics. And that is a, a now a huge problem in British politics because the Labour Party is now very much in thrall to people that Blair fought against all his life. Some of them with views that Clement Attlee and old leaders of the Labour Party would have kept these people out. Some of them are avowed communists. I'm, I don't want to sound like Senator McCarthy, but that is simply the truth. And there should be no place in a social democratic party f for supporters of Marxism, communism in that way. 
You wrote a, a fascinating novel. It was turned into an also fascinating movie. I think the novel is called The Ghost Writer and became the ghost uh, in, in film. But uh, one of the characters is often described as a very thinly veiled version of, of, of Tony Blair. Um, <laughs> thinking about, about that novel and the, the you know, quite <laughs> pointed portrait, uh, I, I was curious whether you've talked to Tony Blair yeah, in, in recent years, is somebody you obviously no. knew well. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, so if not uh, Tony Blair, a question people often ask me as someone who wants to get to know people in politics, uh, in the military, partly to, to think about them in terms of, of my fiction, uh, but also to, to do my a job as a, as a columnist. It's that fascinating uh, puzzle of how you get to know people uh, draw from them what's what's interesting without getting to know them too well, yeah. which is which is dangerous in in our business of journalism and I suspect also our business of, of writing fiction. How, how do you, do you do you talk with politicians? You're famous in Britain. You're a famous uh, p popular novelist. I'm sure people would love to have you to dinner uh, all the time. How do you how do you deal with that? Uh, well, I do know some politicians, and I, I like politicians, to be honest. I take an unfashionable view that I'm glad that they're doing it, because I sure as hell wouldn't want to do it. Um, I'm glad someone's trying to run the health service and uh, to deal with winter flu, and uh, you know. Uh, so I start from the view that they aren't all crooks um, at all. And uh, I did get close to uh, Tony Blair, but you know, what was the basis of that friendship? I was the columnist then on the Sunday Times. Um, rare thing to be in a Murdoch paper and to be, to be allowed to have left of center views. So my friendship with him was based on the fact that I was that. He wasn't, he liked my lovely brown eyes or anything like that. And um, it was interesting to me as a novelist and someone who writes about power to spend time with him. And when he was on the verge of becoming prime minister, uh, I joined him and traveled around. And, and when you say you were on his staff, in fairness, you are right to the extent that I was actually issued with a pass to tra fly with him and on his plane and everything as traveling as a member of his staff rather than as a journalist. And I think that you could say as a journalist, therefore I'd crossed the line. But I took the view that I was not going to carry on writing the column, I was going to write novels, and this was a, a rare opportunity to actually see politics in the raw, to see someone who was about to become prime minister close up. And when, you know, you get the exit poll in Britain, 10 o'clock when the polls have closed and it's unveiled, I was standing next to him, just the two of us looking at the television, and there it came. We are predicting a Labour landslide of 140 seats. And his aide came into the room and said, uh, President Clinton is on the phone for you. Uh, and, you know, to actually see all that and to say, how does it feel to the man to whom that's happening? What novelist wouldn't want to, to ask that? Um, there's a great uh, passage in for Henry James, not a novel, novelist to whom I compare myself, but he said that he had this very intense experience of a, of a summer with all his friends, and it was so powerful that it gave him all the material he needed for the rest of his writing career, in a way. <laughs> and in a funny way, the few weeks that I spent doing that gave me enough material to draw on for a lifetime mm. of seeing what people in these positions alike. Would you ever think of, of writing a, another, a novel more directly about, about Tony Blair? You describe him in a way that makes him it sound irresistible as a, as a subject. I think I should leave him alone, don't you? <laughs> I, think, I, I think he's suffered enough. Uh, and you know, he's never really, he's never complained about the things that I've written. And that I admire it. I, I admire the toughness of politicians. They, t you know, most of them, <laughs> most of them are willing to take whatever they said about them and can do it in a professional way and just differentiate themselves from, from the public persona from the inner man, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and, uh, or woman. And that is a great strength. It's hard to imagine Tony Blair tweeting, but 
maybe <laughs> the Tony Blair of, of today uh, would have. So many of your books have been made into movies or, or TV series, uh, as you just describe as a head for, for Munich. And I, I think we'd all be interested in hearing a little bit about what that's like uh, as a writer when your work is reimagined. Uh, a couple of people that you work with, the, the gee whiz uh, factor for me is, is very high. One of them is Kate Winslet, who starred in the movie that was made of Enigma, I think. Uh, and the other is Roman Polanski, who directed The Ghost and who's one of the most complicated, controversial people mm. in the world of, of, of Hollywood. Maybe you could just say a little bit about each of those people, but also about this larger process of, of writing something that then becomes something yeah. else. It's a more attractive proposition to talk about Kate Winslet, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard to get in trouble talking about Kate Winslet. But. Uh, uh, Kate was uh, uh, wonderful uh, and enthusiastic and... Uh, she, I mean, she's an old-fashioned, old-style star, actually, and the moment the camera loves her, the moment she appears in front of a camera, you know, she's just a big f figure. Well, it's, there's a cruelty about uh, movies, uh, you know, that some really great actors simply don't work, and others, they just have some ingredient, some larger-than-life ingredient, and, and she has it, uh, and she is tremendous. And the whole business of having your work turned into something else is one I find one of the great bonuses of, of, of being a novelist. I mean, uh, I've, the talent that comes in to turn your ideas into something else, you know, sometimes the music, the Enigma score was written by John Barry. It was the, it was the last score that he wrote, and it was, the, the music in it is gorgeous. Alexander Desplat did the, the score for The Ghost. Uh, things like that, things that you feel that have come from you sitting on a, a often cold and unpromising day in front of a screen on your own writing has some, suddenly taken on all these other forms. Sometimes the product isn't very good. Uh, other times it's better than you could have hoped. I've had um, a wonderful experience in the last couple of months. The Royal Shakespeare Company has adapted uh, two of the Cicero books and they, they run over six hours at Stratford. Been one of the great experiences of my professional career has been watching the skill and talent of those actors and the, the direction and the adaptation. That's been wonderful. So. You know, it's a bit like I would imagine having grandchildren, you know, that you're sort of, you can enjoy them and they're part of you, but you can sort of hand them away <laughs> to someone else at the end and you're not entirely responsible for everything. You can just get pleasure from them. I've often thought when people uh, ask us which of our books they should read or which one we like the best as, as author, it is like asking you, which of your children do you love the most? And <laughs> the, the truth is, it's just not a question that you, you can't answer, you, you shouldn't, but the, the, you love each of them in a different way. There are things that you know in each book are, are wonderful, things that are dreadful, things you could go back and rewrite if, 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 if you could. I wanna just uh, ask you to step back and talk about the arc of your career. Uh, you began as a, as a journalist, had enormous success, uh, then began writing fiction, uh, and in, in 1992, Fatherland was published, sold, I, I was reading today, three million copies, I think that's, that's the number, uh, stupendous. Um, I wrote uh, at the, in the acknowledgments at the end of my most recent book that when I published my first novel in 1987, I thought I would have to choose between being a journalist and being a novelist. And I said, I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I straddled the two and kept doing both. You made a, more of a choice. You decided that you wanted uh, to be a, a full-time novelist, pretty much, and you have had an enormous success at that. I'm just curious whether you ever uh, wonder about uh, the journalism side and feel the itch to do more of that, to take a break and go back to writing, you know, 
twice a week. A, a column for for uh, any newspaper would be happy to have you as a column. So, does that have any appeal? None whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strange I'm thing. I'm so sorry to hear you yeah, say that. No, but do you know, that is completely true. I was so pleased to stop being a journalist. I remember the, uh, the day that I start. I wrote the first paragraph of Fatherland, is literally the first paragraph of fiction that I ever wrote. And it really didn't change from the first draft right the way through. And uh, rain coming down in Berlin and a body on the shore. And uh, I, do you know, I can remember I wrote it on a, early on a Saturday afternoon and I had to go and lie down. It was so extraordinary to just be able to make it up. And uh, <laughs> it was the difference between riding a bicycle and flying a helicopter. I just felt I could switch on so much more in my head that I could, and I've never lost that feeling. And uh, although, you know, occasionally when I hit a dry patch as a, a novelist, I went back and wrote and uh, did a columns, a couple more stints of columns, and one of them was the one that brought me into the Blair orbit. Nevertheless, uh, I realized from that moment that, uh, of writing that that was what I wanted to do. And uh, it, it, however bad things have been, and of course sometimes when you're writing you hit very, you know, it doesn't work. And uh, Nevertheless, I've, I would always rather be failing as a novelist and succeeding as a columnist or a journalist. I, and th that, but that's me, but that's, that's simply how I feel. And uh, I took pains really to avoid appearing on, you know, current affairs panels and all that sort of the British equivalent of face the press or whatever, you know, just because I didn't want to get away from what I now saw as the central thing I wanted to do, which was to take my preoccupations about power and the way the world works and to turn them into stories. And that's, you know, so I don't miss journalism, to be honest with you. I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, <laughs> you make you make a, a, a persuasive case. Um, y your novels, uh, for the most part, are, are historical novels. As you've explained to us, they take very contemporary issues of, of power, uh, the way power is exercised, even contemporary personalities. As uh, you talk about Tony Blair, I'm thinking of characters in your book that that uh, uh, drew from what you learned from from, uh, from Blair. But but the, the, by and large, they're uh, historical uh, in their in their frame. And I'm wondering whether you you f find the present that we're living in, especially here in America, but generally, just too outlandish um, for, for fiction. It's just too difficult. It, it, the, 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 the real life characters are, are so, so in, enormous, almost cartoonish, that it's, that it's very hard. I, I write uh, spy novels. You can't think of a spy plot as crazy as what we're, yeah. as what we're living with. So um, I, I'm curious about whether you uh, could be tempted to write more um, novels set in a contemporary uh, time frame, or whether you, you just soon stick, stick with his, historical uh, themes? Well, I think you put your finger on it. I, you know, first of all, in the time between one finishing a novel and it appearing in a bookstore, which can be quite short, two months, uh, nevertheless, anything could happen uh, that would render it obsolete. Uh, things are moving so quickly, and they are, as you say, so outlandish. That an attempt to capture the present. It's a bit like going to Walt Disney World. You know, the thing that's really a bit lame and passe is Epcot, the attempt to capture the future. <laughs> you know, it's the, you know, the fairy stories and so on. That's fine. That feels fresh. And I, I, that's one of the reasons that I, I prefer to write about the past because one can it, it doesn't date. Um, and also, uh, there's more room to develop character. 
you know, the internet is a destruction of our trade, really, because, or any novel. I mean, imagine the opening of Pride and Prejudice, where Mrs. Bennett can Google the people who, you know, <laughs> Mr. Darcy and Mr. Wickham. She'd know everything about them bef before the whole story started. And uh, th this instantaneousness of communication and knowledge is, is uh, highly destructive for, to, uh, to narrative. And uh, I prefer to write novels um, about politics. I really enjoyed writing about the Roman Republic because all of those characters, the Cato, the ideologue who's, uh, who, who's prepared to drive himself mad with the remorselessness of his own logic, the devious, uh, pragmatic Cicero, the businessman turned politician, uh, Crassus, the, you know, each of these archetypes one can recognize today um, and, and I couldn't improve upon how could one in fiction place your president. I really simply, de I've, I'm defeated by it. Anything else. I often feel in my fiction that um, wherever it seems outlandish, improbable, ridiculous, that's the absolute fact. Whenever it seems prosaic, obvious and sure, that's what I've struggled to invent. And. Uh, uh, I write the novels I do because I do, I do just find um, reality so much more extraordinary uh, than anything one can make up. So I, I have a, a quick question. I actually did finally get, I've been looking down at this iPad <laughs> thinking, is there anybody out there? And lo and Hello. behold, a message arrives and somebody's watching this. Uh, it's no. awfully late. Um, from Munich. Um, <laughs> And uh, Be this, careful. <laughs> this person asks, uh, when will Robert be visiting his book's namesake city? So I'll ask you that question, and I have one to conclude with. Well, I'm sorry for this person, but I was actually there in November. Uh, and I did an event in the Führerbau, in the very place where the Munich conference took place. And uh, fascinating it was. So I'm sorry, uh, I, I was there, but you know, I hopefully I'll be back. Our, I won't mention this person by name, but um, I'm sure that she regrets uh, uh, missing that. Another time. Another time. So that leads me to, to ask a final question, which is, um, as you think about your next novel, obviously you love writing fiction. Um, can you give us any hints about time, setting, uh, issues that you want to engage in your next book? You're probably well along with it if I know uh, f fiction writers. I have a, a two or three ideas. Uh, I'd really like to write all of them and I, I'm trying to decide, settle on the one that I, I'll do. I have had a busy run. I've done three novels in three years. Uh, four and five years, if you take in an office and a spy. Uh, I can't, in all conscience, get one finished for this autumn, and uh, therefore I'll take a little more time. I do have an idea, and, it's, and one of the pleasures of life is to carry these ar ideas around in your head, and wherever you go, you're taking this bit of uh, your own inner reality with you. So uh, I brought it with me to America in my head, and. Uh, it, in a sense, it's, it's been a great inner resource wherever I travel. And we can't tease out, out of you uh, just a little <laughs> hint of what it might be about. Well, do you know, I don't think you can do this because if I say to you what my idea is and you raise just a slight skeptical eyebrow, <laughs> I cannot tell you the damage that will do <laughs> to me. And so I have, until it's got a little more strength and it is, can leave the womb and survive, I think I have well, to leave I, it in there. I, in truth, I, I do understand that, that feeling. Uh, I've had it uh, precisely and have gotten skeptical looks that made me think, my God, that was a, such a stupid <laughs> idea. Um, so uh, this uh, has really been a treat. I, I, I just want to say on behalf of the Washington Post, um, what a pleasure it's been to have you here. Um, as I say, you're a, a writer whose work I admire enormously. And to have a chance to talk with you for an hour about the books, the ideas behind them, uh, really, really a, a treat for all of us. So thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe that, that, uh, that Robert will sign uh, books. I hope I'm not mistaken in no. that. So um, they, are, they are for sale and to be signed. 
Yep, the more the merrier, as far as yeah. I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much.